Welcome to another Aspire demonstration movie. In this one, we'll focus on control flow obfuscation. The security requirement that we want to meet with this protection is confidentiality. The concrete goal is to make it hard for someone to reverse engineer the code. At least we want to prevent simple static reverse engineering. So we want to make it hard to reconstruct control flow and to reconstruct the original functions of the application. We also want to make it hard to just partition all the code into their original components. For example, we want to make it hard to differentiate between original application code and protection code. Of course, that implies that we should be able to deploy the protections on both application code and on the code implementing other protections. More concretely, we want to replace direct control flow with indirect flow because indirect flow requires code analysis in order to find out potential targets of the control flow transfers. We also want to add control flow paths of which the attacker does not know that in fact they will never be executed during the program execution. We want to mix code from different procedures and from different modules that constitute the program to hide the actual composition of the program. And on top, what we would really like is that in the final program, there are code fragments that implement both parts of the original application and part of a protection. If we can do that, some code fragments will contribute to the semantics of the original application and to the semantics of a protection. And we think that if we can achieve this, that it will be much harder for an attacker to comprehend what's going on. Because it's hard in the mental model that an attacker builds of an application to differentiate between the different roles that a single fragment will play. So what protections do we develop and implement? Well, the first one is branch functions. This is an existing protection that was first proposed by Lin and Debray to thwart static disassemblers. How does this work? Well, suppose you have this code fragment and you want to hide the control flow at some point. So for example, here you want to hide that these two instructions are always executed after each other. Well, we transform the code and what you see here is you have the original compare, then we prepare some arguments and we jump to a branch function. The branch function will then transfer control to the rest of the code, which you see here, but it will do so via indirect branches. In this simple form here that we implemented in the project, we just add the arguments that were fed to the branch function and we transfer control to it because we put the result in the instruction pointer register. This is a very simple implementation that's relatively easy to attack, but the main goal of implementing this existing technique in the project was to study its composition with other techniques. So we didn't focus on developing new, harder to attack branch functions within this project. Another form of obfuscation that we uh, investigated and that we integrated with the other techniques were opaque predicates. Suppose you have the same fragment and then in some other location here in between these moves, we want to make it look like there's more possible control flow. So what we do here is we split the block and we insert a bunch of additional computations that ends with a conditional branch. And so control can resume in two directions. And so unless an attacker analyzes this code, and deduces that the branch will actually always be taken, it looks as if control can flow in two directions. So the control flow graph here after the transformation is more complex and the code will be harder to reverse engineer because of this opaque predicate. A third form of protections that we implemented is code flattening. In this fragment, one can clearly see the structure. It's an if then else here with a loop. This edge is drawn downwards, but actually it's a loop. Uh, you can execute this block multiple times. We transform the code and we insert kind of a dispatcher. So here you have a dispatch block and from this block you can reach every other block in the program. You can reach this block, you can reach this block, you can reach this block and so on. And after the execution of each block control is transferred again to this dispatcher. An additional form of obfuscation is code layout randomization. So typically in a program you would see that all the code of the different functions is stored contiguously. You have first all the code of function 1, then of function 2, then of function 3, and so on. What we do is we cut the functionality in pieces. This has been proposed before, for example, for cache optimization. But we do so for security purposes. We break up all the functions and we just mix the different parts in memory. Now we combine this with the previously discussed forms of obfuscation and we replace direct control flow with indirect control flow, it becomes very hard for the attacker to find out which pieces belong together here. Now, if possible, we even want to go further. Suppose, for example, that function 2 here is a function from the original program, but function 3 is part of a protection that was injected by our toolchain 
into the uh, binary, then ideally we want to find fragments that maybe are identical in both functions. So it might be, for example, that this fragment here and this fragment here are identical. What we then do is we apply code fracturing techniques, and so we replace this, these two identical or almost identical uh, fragments, we replace them and we merge them into one fragment. And then this fragment basically executes functionality of both the original function 2 and the ori original function 3, and we put it in a separate function 5, uh, and this function has two semantic roles in the program. If you wonder how we prototyped all these transformations, well, we did so in the Diablo link time rewriter developed at Ghent University. Now, let's have a look at how this worked out in practice. Okay, so in the live demo, here we have a function in a use case to be protected. The function is called int login core. You see here that we have a pragma describing which protections should be applied. So we're going to flatten the function. We're going to introduce uh, opaque predicates and we're going to introduce branch functions and we've also marked how frequently we want to do this so like one out of three blocks approximately in the control flow graph of this function will insert a branch function and in one out of five uh, blocks uh, with 20 percent chance we'll introduce opaque predicates now if you look at the function it's mainly a list of if then else's there's a small loop where licenses are loaded and then uh, the different types of licenses are checked down in the function um, to check whether certain licenses are available to give access to some assets. Our link time rewriter Diablo applies all these transformations. We can look at the code before transformation as Diablo sees it. You see this is very nice control flow graph. Uh, there's a small loop here but you see you nicely see the if then else structure. If you open the original unprotected binary in either pro you see immediately that for this function I've already found the function you see that the control flow graph looks very similar and also when we zoom in, let me zoom in on the entry um, of this block of this function, you see there's some code here and you see that in either pro, if I zoom in there, you see it's the same code. The block is a little bit larger here than here, that's because we start a new block whenever there's a call and in either pro the block continues here. But you see it's the same code. Now Diablo, the link time rewriter, also produces a dot file that describes the control flow of this function after all the transformations have been applied. And that looks like this. You see it's very complex uh, control flow graph. And if you zoom in, you see really that it's filled with lots of code. Uh, you see that branch functions are being invoked. You actually see, if we zoom in here, the switch function, that's where the dispatcher is implemented. And you see that this is very complex. If you look up this code in IDA Pro, what you see is that actually IDA Pro only discovers a really small piece of code and the reason is, of course, that already at the start of the function, a branch function uh, is invoked and either pro loses track of control flow at that point because it cannot analyze uh, the dynamic computations of the, the continuation address. So it's clear that as a result of this protection, either pro has become almost worthless. Now for demonstrating code randomization and factorization, I'm going to go back to a slide and I want to show you this picture. And in this picture, each pixel presents one instruction of a program that we protected. Red pixels mark instructions that belong to the original application. Blue pixels mark instructions that belong to a so-called soft VM. This is a virtual machine that interprets bytecode that's injected into the program. White code represents stubs. These are small code pieces that are uh, used to transfer control from the original application code to the soft VM. In black, you see factored pixels. These are instructions that come from both the soft VM and the original application. And then in different shades of green, you see code that has been injected to implement different forms of obfuscations, code flattening, branch functions, and opaque predicates. You can clearly see here that all the code, specifically that of the soft VM and the original application, is completely mingled. Uh, if we zoom in, this becomes even more clear and you see that very short code fragments are actually intertwined in this program. We think this is a pretty good visualization of the strength of the code randomization and factorization. This project was sponsored by the European Union 7 Framework Program under grant agreement number 609734.